more time for um, one of our commissioners to arrive. Um, today we'll have <clears throat> five of us here uh, to go through this workshop. Uh, a couple of folks, a couple of the commissioners are out of town. Um, and uh, Commissioner Flowers will be joining us here shortly. Today we're going to um, do an update on the uh, state of emergency and talk about uh, the rescinding the local state of emergency. Then we're going to have a workshop just on one item. It's, uh, it's really the, the Grand Canal dredging project. Can I get some staff work, staff us up a little bit? Um, <clears throat> and, uh, and then finish with the agenda briefing. So. Um, Barry, without further ado, let's get to you and get, get the review underway. Okay, well, good morning, commissioners. Um, luckily, as you're well aware, we dodged a, a bullet <laughs> um, as the storm kind of went around us and, um, and most of the impacts were over in uh, Polk County and then uh, north of us. Um, when Elsa reached us, though, you know, it, it, it was at hurricane strength at, at, uh, from the flights but we really never received sustained winds um, at hurricane strength. Um, the wind gust in, in, in Pinellas County uh, got up to about 59 miles an hour in some spots. Uh, we, we produ it produced about one to two feet of storm surge. At the maximum, um, we had about 6,900 customers that lost power. Um, no major storm damage uh, or injuries uh, reported. Uh, there were actually fewer 911 calls um, than normal because people, um, you know, uh, kind of sheltered in place and, and uh, weren't out on the roads. Um, we had no water rescues, which always occurs, you know, in low-lying areas as they get, you know, a storm surge in the middle of the night. And so it, overall, it was a um, it, it, it was a non-event. You know, we we were we were ready uh, for the worst. Um, luckily, we didn't have to. Um, activate and um, and do that, but our, we but we were ready. Um, we had a level two activation um, yesterday. We closed the uh, citizen information center at three o'clock. Uh, during that time period, we took 1,600 calls from residents and another 870 live chats. Um, so people were concerned. They were calling in. As you as you know, we opened uh, two community shelters at Loman Exchange and at Ross Norton. We had 170 people go to those shelters, um, 11 dogs and one cat. So, uh, so for those that needed them, you know, and didn't feel comfortable at home, uh, it was there for them, and so it was a good community uh, resource for those that um, needed to go there. We had a few lift, uh, lift stations that lost power, but we used generators to keep those going. We did not have to issue boil alerts. Um, our public crew, uh, works crews. You know, they, uh, they work to drain hot spots and uh, keep everything flowing. Um, Sunstar um, had a number of calls, um, you know, but we had a few down trees, some minor flooding. Um, but overall, um, not, a, uh, not a bad event. We did not have to act, use any emergency authority. Um, we did not do any uh, mandates or, um, or emergency purchases or anything like that. So. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions, um, but other than that, you know, we, we we didn't really use the authority granted under the emergency powers. But, you know, if we needed to, we had it available, uh, which is the whole purpose of of doing it. So, yeah, questions for Barry. Yeah, Commissioner Justice. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Not really a question. Just want to thank you and the entire staff, emergency management, communications, um, all the information that you shared with us. We were able to share with our social media and our email blasts and things like that. And um, so it's, it's a great resource. So thank you. Thank you. The emergency management team did a, an amazing job. And I, I mean the whole team. Commissioner Gerard. I just wanted to thank Commissioner Justice for being our local weatherman. <laughs> yeah. Our, yeah, our really. Dennis Phillips of the commission. <laughs> <laughs> Rule number seven. Um, um, oh, I forgot what I was going to ask. Will you hold that thought? Never. Well, I'm just, I'm just oh. hoping. <laughs> this, I mean, I've lived here for 50 years. I think this is the first time, the closest that a hurricane's actually gotten to us. That was sort of technically a hurricane. And I'm just hoping people don't get complacent about that because <laughs> this was not a hurricane in the, you know, usual sense of the word. And I didn't see anybody getting really excited about it which is a little scary, actually. Yeah, 
I, I, I know. I mean, it, it's really hard because you're, so let me, for, I think for the public, one of the things to remember is it takes us 17 hours using transport resources to clear the barrier islands. And so you're looking at a hurricane potential and you have to wait till it crosses Cuba, which gives you now 11 hours after it does that at the speed it was going. And remember, it, it was moving faster before. So you're trying to make some decisions and you don't want to cry wolf and, and take, you know, but that's the, that's the challenge that, that we have in trying to try to make those right decisions. And um, uh, luckily, you know, it did slow down and, and, and we felt pretty comfortable where we were at on this one. But had it been bigger, you know, you're, you're trying to make these decisions and as <laughs> Commissioner Justice sh shows you all, you're getting a spaghetti map of 50 different ways it can go and, you know, and you're, and you're trying to make the best judgment call <laughs> and not, you know, not put people in harm's way. Um, if it does come at us at full strength. So, yeah, that, that is the decision making that we kind of go through and we, we pull all of our experts together and we try to make the best call we can. Commissioner Long. Thank you, Barry, for those uh, well put <laughs> words. And all of what has been said at this point just bears more importance to our continuing to work as a well oiled team because clearly we were as prepared as any county could possibly be. And I give you and the sheriff and Lourdes and all of Della Jewel, there you just <laughs> cannot go down the list, Jill. You know, incredible kudos for coming together, which we have been doing all through this past year during the pandemic. And I just love that the leadership team is not vested in just one individual. It's a team of very um, good, knowledgeable experts that can come together and know how to work together. So I think that's a, a big part of why we have been so successful. And I would like to think that in the big picture, our citizens appreciate that as well. Thank you. So, Commissioner Justice. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And one last thought from is, yeah, it's most of us have lived here a long time, and and we can kind of joke about it or take uh, get a little complacent. And it's important not to panic over a tropical depression, you know, just coming off the coast of Africa. But all we have to do is look at Michael a couple of years ago to see how it can go from a storm that's supposed to completely dissipate to a devastation overnight. And so it's just something to always. Keep on our radars. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Yeah, uh, Barry, I too wanted to pass along uh, my kudos to your, your team, uh, your organization. Also, um, what seemed to be a really good uh, communication with the, the governor's office as well as our own partners, um, mm -hmm. the city partners. So it obviously has one conversation in the morning and then one with our partners in the afternoon. Um, so just maybe you could speak to that a little bit, just that dynamic, um, and then maybe a little bit to the beach operations aspect that we we implemented, but it was a little softer than it would it could be. Uh, you know, the keeping people off the beaches or keep you know getting people oh. <laughs> just uh, just talk a little bit yeah. to that. To those two items, it would be great. Thank you. Well, thank you, commissioners. Um, the team does. Um, operate well and when I say the team it's you know from the sheriff to um, health department you know to all of our different departments and and community partners um, you know we had the Red Cross um, you know over helping at our shelters and and so it, it really is a team effort um, and true sense of the word from you know, everybody kind of pitching in um, when when we you know, were trying to figure out because remember at a category one hurricane and evacuation, we opened, we we're gonna open 13 shelters, um, but we ended up only opening two. But guess what, I, I need people, you know, to run those shelters and I've got a really quick time period to do that. I put out a call for volunteers and we had 125 county employees step forward. I mean, that's amazing, you know? And so um, it's, it's that type of teamwork where people understand the need you know, for us to come together to be prepared and do our job if we need to. 
Um, and so everybody does work together. With our community partners, um, we, we, continue, we do a, it's called a rock call, and we, we do that typically in the afternoon, and that's all of our preparations. We have over 200 people on that rock call. I've, I'd have to get the number from Lourdes, but <laughs> it's, uh, <clears throat> it's up there. <clears throat> We, I, did, I did some direct city manager calls, but I, I also pushed the city managers to that rock call. All the cities have like their public works directors or emergency management people on that call. Um, and so that's kind of the coordination effort. Everybody from people that are doing housing to, um, uh, to all kinds of community volunteers. So um, we, we did a couple of those just as, as a coordination. Touch base, what are your resource needs? Make sure, so we have, um, it's called Web EOC, and so that is our automated way. They, they can put in their requisitions for um, if they need you know, a backhoe or they need um, some type of assistance. That's where you go and you, you put that in. We source that. We can go to the state. You know, that's the governor's order. That, that avails us to be able to utilize state resources. So if we can't fulfill that, then we can push that up and get regional assistance through the state. And so that coordinated response is key. And, um, and we, we work really well together as a, as a whole community to uh, provide that type of coordinated response. And then a little bit just about the beach operations and keeping folks from getting onto the beaches or coming off the beaches. <coughs> And the sheriff's role in that. We got a so couple emails. We made, yeah, yeah, we made a, um, the sheriff and I made a call early on that, you know, we, we don't need to do mandatory evacuations. But we also know that, you know, when you have a weather event like that, people are going to see that as something cool to watch, you know, and or brag, grab their surfboard and, and, and go try to ride the waves and, you know, things that we don't need. And we have a lot of people that live on the beach or they're in a hotel or they got a business. They, ha they have a, a reason to be there. Um, and so the sheriff uh, posted resources to prevent people that didn't need to go down there um, from going down there. And, and what we were really concerned about is obviously in the morning, people, you know, we, at that time, we anticipated when we made that call that we were gonna have down power lines, down trees. We didn't think it was gonna be devastating, but you know, it takes time to clean that stuff up. And so we didn't need people that didn't need to be there. And so that's the reason that um, he posted resources to be able to prevent people to go. If, if, you, if you needed to be down there, you work at a business, you own a business, you are in a hotel, you, then obviously they would let you through. Um, but, but we were you know, telling people just to go home if, uh, if you didn't have a reason to be there. And then the final question I had, Barry, was, uh, you know, fast forward a couple of months and we're in the middle of school schools, uh, session um, and we have issues like that came up, another storm comes. Who is primarily at this point responsible for staffing those schools? Uh, would we do it in partnership or is it uh, pretty much a, uh, it used to be a school uh, function, yeah. but now it's a mixed? It's a partnership yeah. um, between the schools um, and us. And so they, you know, they own their building, they have their maintenance, they have their food service and things like that. And then we um, get volunteers to run our sheltering operations. Um, and so, um, that, that changed, um, you know, during the pandemic and concern out of um, people getting, you know, COVID. And, and so we've tried to partner on that. Um, Dr. Greco and the schools have been great partners. Um, and so this is, that's more typical of the way, way other communities have run that. So we do have some challenges when we get up to a level three hurricane, if that occurred, on, on being able to staff those. But that's where, we, you know, our, our employees have really stepped forward. And we need to continue to work on that and expand that out and get city participation and others. Um, so there's some work to do there, um, but it's but it's a true partnership. He's part of our leadership team, you know. So our executive policy team, you know, includes schools, includes sheriff, includes Dr. Cho, uh, includes you know emergency management and you know Lourdes and others. So. Um, we come together and, and make those decisions together. Yeah, and it's certainly not an easy thing to leave your home and go work at a shelter, but clearly for our residents, mo one of the most important things that we do at those times. So appreciate that. Um, any other comments or questions? Uh, Commissioner Long. Yes. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And um, to switch gears totally, Barry, at our meeting on Tuesday, would it be possible to have Dr. Cho come and give us an update on the deviant um, rising cases? I am continuing to receive 
calls and emails about that issue, and there doesn't seem to be much specific data yet that we know of for Pinellas. But I do think, given what's going on yeah. around us and throughout the state and nation, that it would be important for us to pay attention. I, I would be happy to ask Dr. Cho. I, I haven't asked him at this point to be there, so unless he has an engagement that he can't break, I'm sure he would be happy to come. So I'll ask Lourdes to reach out to him. And Thank you. And, and Barry, I'm assuming that uh, you don't really need the state of emergency anymore. I, I do uh, not. So we, we can take action on rescinding that this morning. Sure. Um, does anybody have any questions or issues on that? And if not, I need a motion to rescind the state of emergency. Commissioner Flowers made the motion. Commissioner Gerard made the second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Uh, state of emergency uh, officially has been rescinded. Okay, um, Barry, let's move on to um, uh, really the one workshop item <laughs> aside from the agenda briefing that we have today. Uh, okay, good morning again. Um, th this workshop item is on the Grand Canal and the dredging uh, project out there. Um, I'm going to ask Kelly to come forward and give you an update. I then want to talk about, you know, we, um, we know the concerns that are, that are out and, and I want to fill in kind of, you know, some of the financial issues involved, uh, but I'll do it after she kind of concludes her presentation. So go ahead, Kelly. Okay. Good morning, Kelly. Good morning. Uh, Kelly Hammer-Levy, uh, Director of Public Works. All right, so congratulations to the Lightning. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that was a that was a sweet surprise this morning. So, um, so yes. Good morning. Uh, back in May of 2020, uh, we uh, brought forward a, a study that had been uh, looking at the Grand Canal issue and, and navigational issues in the area generally. Uh, with that, the board um, asked us to move forward with looking at the Grand Canal specifically and designing and permitting a project to address the navigational challenges in the area. So I just want to provide a little bit of development history. Um, these questions have come up um, a lot of times, you know, with regard to how the Grand Canal came to be. And so generally um, what you're looking at in that, in that left-hand photo is a, a very shallow system that's from 1951 before anything really happened out there. See a lot of sand, it's, it's you know, generally a very dynamic system and, and that has continued to its present day. Um, back in uh, 1957, the Terra Verde Corporation submitted a, a permit to the state and to the county to dredge and fill this area. And you can see over, over to the right-hand side uh, the areas that they proposed to dredge, which includes the Grand Canal area right there and Big Pine and Pine Key Pass right there, and then the Finger Canals here. Also shows another development down here that never occurred. So, you know, that, that is generally, you know, how that came to be um, was through the development um, project by the Chair Verde Corporation. And we kind of look at modern day today. This is, you know, what we're seeing today. We've got the Grand Canal um, that everybody is most familiar with. And then I just took that development plan and kind of laid out the modern um, configuration and, and what it looks like. So just some general points. You can see Pine Key is, is now, you know, a developed community. Um, you can see, you know, the big pi the Pine Key pat, um, cutoff right here um, is that relict uh, channel system there. Uh, the Grand Canal, you know, here and its alignment is, is here. You can see Shell Key is this tiny little, tiny little island here that has evolved into this, into this large barrier system. Cabbage Key is to here. And, you know, the area that um, apparently was to be developed um, actually became part of Shell Key Preserve. So just a little history on um, on how, how the area has evolved through time. So I mentioned back in 2020, um, APTIM was brought on board to take um, the University of South Florida's study to the next level to specifically look at how um, and what and you know, what are the causes and how, we, how this system has changed through time. And what we reinforced was that you know, this area is much bigger than this localized issue. It is part of uh, the inlet complex of Tampa Bay, which has a significant amount of sand um, contributing to this area. It's also part of the Passagrill system. 
We have seen significant regional changes to this shoal system over the last 50 to 60 years. You can see it in these in these aerial in these aerials along the bottom. I've tried to highlight, you know, in yellow how that system has evolved through time and and grown into um, you know, larger shoals. Um, but what we did also learn from this study was that uh, the closing of the pass there at the north, um, the North Shell Key Pass, which um, separates, you know, the interior of Shell Key from Grand Canal, um, was not from beach nourishment. Okay, it was part of, it's part of this complex. And so what the conclusions were from the study, and the blue is in this, in this aerial, shows you areas of sand loss, Red shows you areas of sand gain. And over a period of time, about 30,000 cubic yards of sand is, has been eroding from the west shoreline of, of Shell Key, moving to the north, and then shifting to the east and closing off that area and creating quite a large berm of sand there. Uh, we also know that water flow, both measured and modeled within the Grand Canal, is very low. All right, There's not a lot of tidal flushing through there, and that is not something that we can change. All right, that's a natural condition. Um, we learned that opening, you know, North Pass, again, that's, that's the north-south cut, not the east-west cut, um, is, not, is not feasible. One, because the sand is continuing to migrate to the east, um, and two, because of private property um, issues in that location. And that the recommendation that came out of the study was that if we can best manage sand within the Grand Canal proper, um, that, is, that is something that's more easily permitted and more easily managed in the long term. So taking that information, you know, we, oh, sh sorry, sir. Go so, a things, Kelly. When you mentioned the shifting sands, your comment, I believe, was over a period of time. Mm -hmm. Could you be a little more specific about what that period of time was? I have a reason for asking that question. <laughs> um, you know, we received complaints about um, this area closing off as early as 2011. All right, and then um, there was the private dredging effort that occurred Around, tw around 2013, I believe, um, that closed about six months later. Um, there were some storms that kind of changed the configuration. And then, you know, this is more, this picture right here is, I think, more modern. It's, I think, believe this is 2015 through 2019 evolution. Okay, I have a couple more questions about the shifting sands in that particular era, but I'll save them until you get done because you may answer my questions. Okay, Thank sure. you. No problem. Oh, yes, sir. <clears throat> um, just back to the, um, I, I always get the, the names of the facilities um, messed up, but the Shell Key area that filled in. Um, you know, the north, what, yeah, what the, is called Shell Key North Pass? Yeah. Yeah. Um, you, you, you said, you said, I think three different things. You said um, uh, that there's private property issues, mm -hmm. which, you know, again, I, I, I just don't, un I don't understand that piece. Um, okay. You said there's migrating sand and permitting would be a, a challenge. It just seems to me, is there any, is there, aside from those minor little problems that you just mentioned, I'm kidding, I know that they're significant, but aside from that, there seems to be just in a, um, an opportunity to have a lot of, 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 of uh, I guess, tidal, not tidal, but uh, if you open that up, the flow of the water really would uh, benefit this area uh, of Bunces Pass or, or the Grand Canal from building up. Is, is there any, do you, do you feel that, do you sense that out there at all, or uh, is it worth the effort to try to open that up, even though it would be a challenge um, or is it just impossible? I mean, and I'm not even saying this first go around. Maybe we, this first go around, we have to do the dredging there. But is there something that we should be looking at there, to kind of have that more of a, a more, that flow going a little better, and maybe not allowing as much buildup? Or is that just, just your thoughts on that? Well, the thing is, we can't, we cannot increase the tidal prism. The tidal prism is what it is. So, if we. Um, 
you know, if we were to try to force that to stay open, and I don't even, I mean, it would require extensive armoring, probably sheet piling, um, extensive dredging within the preserve um, to force it, then you're basically stealing from the other inlets. So um, if you think of the inlet like a pie, you know, the pie slices, you know, can you can make the pie slices smaller, but you can't increase the size of the pie. It just, you have, you know, just the tidal prism is not infinite. So it really won't, and as a matter of fact, the South Channel, what they call South Passagrill Channel, closed on its own. And it closed from the pressures of these of these shoals building. And that is outlined in, in both Dr., um, both in the Aptum study and Dr. Wang's work is, um, you know, the channel kind of comes this way. And you can start to see this is, this is building. Well, soon as, soon as this completely closed off, you know, the, this, this channel here um, weakened and the flow basically went to nothing. So it would, cre it would, it would take a huge manipulation to try to recreate that south channel. And again, it, it's not gonna create you know, more flow um, in the system, it'll, it'll, it'll remove flow from Passagirl Channel. It may impact Bunce's Pass, um, but we're not going to create more water flow. It's, it's got to come from somewhere else. It's got to come from one of the two existing inlets. Okay. All right. Go ahead. Okay. So we moved forward um, with uh, developing the scope of service for the design of the Grand Canal, um, dredging and what we called Basin A in the report. And it's, it's called Basin 3 here because Basin A evolved into three different designs. So Basin 3 was um, the most permittable and, um, and provided the best outcome. So I'm just gonna talk about Basin 3. Um, but I wanted to refer back to Basin A because if someone goes back to the Aptum study, it's called Basin A in that, in that document. All right, so in anywhere where there's a gold star, that's a really important thing, and I don't want to forget about it, so please don't let me forget about it. <laughs> so I've, I've heard a lot about, can we hurry this up, can we hurry this up, can we hurry this up? And we can to a point, but there is a lot of permitting hurdles to dredging out a new project like this. This is not considered a maintenance dredge. Um, Basin 3 is a brand new dredge. We have to do extensive um, resource assessment. Uh, we have to get approval from the state's cultural resource group in looking at, um, you know, potential uh, act, um, cultural remains that may be in there. Um, there's a lot of survey and bathymetry work, geotechnical evaluation. We have to look at that material to determine what, how we can properly dispose of it. And then we have to model all those alternatives, and we have to be able to demonstrate, one, that it's going to work, and two, that we're not going to cause harm somewhere else. And so the design that we have is generally laid out in that picture to the left. And it, the Grand Canal follows its existing alignment. There's no proposed change to that alignment. And that was how it was dredged back um, in, as part of the Tierra Verde Development Corporation's project, and, and that alignment would be proposed to stay. Basin 3 is basically a, a sand sump, if you will. So as sand is moving from west to east, uh, sand would fill in that basin first before it would ever impact the channel, keeping the channel open for a longer period of time. So that is, that is the design. Um, those are the two key components of the design that we've been looking at. And then the bigger challenge was what do we do with this material and where do we put it? Um, you know, so. That goes into quality of material and, and what its qualifying uses are. We have been trying to look very carefully at a public purpose to that material, because if we can find a public purpose to that material, then there's an opportunity for the county to participate in the project. And then we are required to get permits from the Army Corps of Engineers and the Department of Environmental Protection. So. Um, it's, it's, not a, it's, it's not just a rubber stamp process. It, it takes time, it takes a lot of data collection, and, and that is what we've been doing for the past year. And the Basin 3 then, Kelly, that's the area that would be um, kind of capture the sand in the future that would have to be cleaned out periodically. Cleaned out periodically yes. to keep the canal open. Yes. Um, okay. And that, the, I mean, I, that design is, is that box is there, but in the, but in reality, um, if this moves forward, that the shape of that area would 
migrate with the mean high water line because um, that is where Colony Key owns to. So Colony Key owns that accreted sand to the mean high water line. So that would have to, it's kind of a floating um, boundary, if you will. We have it surveyed, but um, it does, obviously it does change through time. Um, when you go into the canal, before you start to go north there, there's a lot of sand that's built up over there as well. Is that an area that we would be clearing out as also, or is it just the basin and the, and the main? In the main canal, just the basin and the main canal. Um, again, that the that accreted sand there is owned by the upland riparian owners to the mean high water line. Um, okay. Um, the um, just I was just trying to to picture. Um, I was out there the other day. Uh, thank you, Sharon Calvert and her husband for get, getting me out on their boat, so I could kind of get through that area and just try to understand and see it a little better. Some of those pictures that you have from the sky are pretty telling as well as far as how quickly things seem to be moving. Um, so it's kind of, it, it is kind of scary as far as, what's your estimated time to start this dredge? I mean, are we, are we talking a year? Are we talking six months? Or what, are, I mean, I know that you're gonna get into that in just a little bit, but. I, to me, it just seems it really is screaming for action quicker. I mean, I know you, you've mentioned that a little bit this morning, but um, I, I guess I'm just con concerned there from a safety perspective. I'm concerned that it's gonna be closing and making it narrower before we even get to the job. And there's there seem to be docks on the north side mm -hmm. and people all over those beaches on the south side. It's almost like it's becoming <laughs> are we going to have some enforcement issues? Are, are, are people are supposed to be beaching there? or? Um, I, well, if they live there, sure. I mean, it's, it's technically it's, it belongs to um, the property owners there along Colony Key, which is a little, um, there are some single family residences there. When you cur turn onto Colony Drive, there are three um, single family homes there. Um, and then you have the Colony Key development itself. So um, if it's folks that are that live there or staying there, you know, then they would, I mean, it's their property, but if they're, if they're not, then technically the property owners could call for, you know, trespassing. Okay. Like she's, so, got, she's got slides on the, on the yeah. timeline and the permitting yeah. issues yeah. involved. Um, so you know. I, I know, but I'm, I'm, these questions are popping in along the way, and I'm afraid, like, she has those stars up there that, so she doesn't forget, that I'll forget some of these questions. And okay. so these are, I mean, literally, that area there, if, you're gonna, if we're going to allow that to happen or we can't do anything about it, then this becomes even more important to do well, something okay, quickly. Okay, let me, let me yeah. uh, clarify a point that I think, yes. you know, just I think would be helpful. All right, so... I mentioned, you know, that really the north-south cut, and, and part of the reason why um, that area, well, one, there's technical challenges and permitting challenges. That aside, that area is owned by Colony Key, and so it is private property, and um, the what? feedback we have received is that they do not support reopening that, and it's their property. Where is that? I'm sorry. That's the north-south cut right here. All right. So that is their property. Um, actually, the... Relic, the relic channel there that was there was is actually on their property. And we had done an extensive survey uh, with um, input from the Department of Environmental Protection and they, they confirmed that. Um, and that, that map is actually in the report, um, the Aptim report, and, and that, that was brought up during the two community meetings that that channel is actually sitting on private property. Okay, uh, Commissioner Justice. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So the, the condo development there, Colony Key, now owns land westward to what point? Where the channel, the west end of where the channel was or the east end of the, where the channel began, the north pass? They own to the county boundary of Shell Key. Okay. So, so that would be, in my mind, where the north pass the western side of the North Pass. Yeah, it's not too much far past that, and, and parks the Parks Department does have a sign right there that it says you are now entering the Shell Key Preserve. So it's right about that location. It was, it was amazing how fast they went from wanting to keep that channel open to advertising for private beach. Yeah, and Mr. Chair? Yes, go ahead. Yes, sure. I would also just like to state that 
it wasn't very many years ago that my family and I actually were out in that area on Shell Key and taking that canal through to Billy's place to have lunch or dinner whenever we happened to be out on the water. And I can clearly remember walking across that area when Colony Key was not even there. And it's interesting, as Commissioner Justice just made point, that this is, a, this is a condominium that rose up, a multi-million dollar condominium. It's, I don't know how many stories it is, but it is really, really high. And when they built it, it was at the water's edge. And now they have their own private beach. So, it is interesting how their uh, ideas have changed. And Commissioner Eggers, if you really want to know the history of that area, I encourage you to go out with the Sheriff's Marine Patrol. I've done that. Because I was, I was just, it's unbelievable when they showed me, and I don't even remember the name of it, they've named this new island that has popped up and it popped up within the last three years. So imagine going from a boatway where you could go back and forth through the water, and now there's an island right there in the middle of it. It's extraordinary. Yeah. So we need to think about the fast-moving currents and how quickly things are changing there yeah. as we go forward with whatever solution we come up yeah. with Agreed. or not. Agreed. And I'm sure Jewel is well versed in the history of the Colony Key um, development. It's 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 got a long history there uh, that I won't spend any time on here. But um, you know we are doing our best to to there are there are a lot of wants and needs. There's residents on the canal. There's there's the marina. There's Colony Key, and and everybody has different perspectives. And we're doing our best to work with with everybody's feedback. Um, the other point I will make is that, you know, Colony Key has expressed some concern about uh, Basin 3 uh, regarding any impacts to their flood insurance. They did a, a local map revision um, for, uh, you know, for their property um, that resulted in a substantial reduction in their flood insurance, and they were concerned about losing that. And we have looked at that very, very very strong, looked at it multiple different ways, and, and our engineering firm is very, um, very convinced that there's no impacts with um, Basin 3 at all. And we will be, any, any information they ask of us, we will readily provide for their review. Okay, go ahead, Kelly. Okay. All right, so here is that permitting timetable, and, um, you know, to your point, um, uh, Commissioner Eggers, um, I know, didn't make my biggest point. The, we talked about the north-south and, and why that really, you know, doesn't work. Um, but I also want to be very clear that what we see out there today are called accretions. They've occurred over time, okay? And so when I say Colony Key owns those accretions, um, that is state law, and the state makes those determinations. We, we work with the state's division of survey and mapping, and, and they may help us make those determinations so we understand, you know, the limits in which to work. But if, say, ELSA had come through and pushed a ton of sand right into the canal and closed it, that's called an avulsion. And there is no property rights over, an, a, private property rights over an avulsion. And we could still design and permit a project to remove that sand. Okay, so there's two different things going on there. Um, so I just want to be very clear that if, if an event were to close it, it could be permitted to be reopened. Okay. And that's a, that's a big deal because that's part of the concerns the residents have, obviously. That is a change from our initial look at that back when we were doing the community meetings. And, and, and I know that, and I want to just highlight that because um, they've, the county attorney's office has looked at this very closely <laughs> before we made that statement. Um, but it, that's good to know, though, because um, I know that's a lot of the residents' concerns. But what if, what if the avulsion, what if a hurricane came through and instead of filling it totally, it 
opened it wider than it ever has been before. What if that was the case? Is that possible? Yeah, sure. Absolutely. I mean, look at what happened during our Irma, and Irma split Shell Key in two, and now we have Irma Pass. I mean, so now we have a pass that we never had before, and people are using it, and yeah, I mean, I think the island you might have been referring to is Outback Key, kind of off of Fort Soto, huge. It just, I mean, it formed, that is a one that comes and goes every 25 years. Um, yeah, they, they form, and it's just a natural cycle. So it's a very dynamic system. You're absolutely right. A storm could change the configuration of what's out there at any time, and we would have to relook at it. Uh, yesterday, when the sheriff went up to um, fly some areas, I did ask him to um, get video of this area specifically during low tide. So I should be getting those that video today, so we can take a look at you know what it's showing there. And um, we also have you know staff out there. Um, actually, we have we have a lot of beach work to do anyway. Get out there and, and survey what has occurred after Elsa. So so tidal the the, the storms that come and build beaches, accretion, uh, becomes property, private property rights. Um, can they then protect that uh, by building seawalls? No. No, no. So um, just storms don't build accretions. Accretions occur over time just through natural processes. Okay. A storm would be an avulsion. Okay. All right. All right. So they cannot do that. Um, and bulkheading, that type of thing would be next to impossible. I mean, we, it's a, that would be a very difficult thing to do. <laughs> I don't even know that it would be permittable. Again, it's a, a very, very highly dynamic system, and um, actually bulkheading a system like that would actually create more erosion, so it, it could be very problematic. So with some of the other milestones here, um, you brought up permitting, and, and that really is the key here. Um, we have been in touch with the regulatory agencies every step of the way, and, and the reason for that is when you submit a permit application, it is, you know, you, it can be a month later, it can be several months later, you will usually get what's called a request for information, an RFI. And we want to minimize that because an RFI basically extend, basically restarts the permitting schedule. So um, we get an RFI, then we respond to it, then it starts over. And now the state has prescriptive timelines in which they have to either approve or deny a permit application. And so the state process is, is more, um, more predictable, and we have that timeline laid out there. This, the feds, uh, the Army Corps, uh, we, they do not have any type of timeline. We put in a year because we, we don't know. It is not uncommon for a lot of our projects that require Army Corps permitting to take at least a year. Um, we are hopeful that because we have been having these conversations along the way, that that won't happen, but you know, we can't predict how, how that might occur. Is that just because of the technical type of work, or is it just red tape, or is it, <coughs> is it process that just gets buried somewhere, or how, how does that, it just seems like it wouldn't take, I mean, it, it's something that becomes critically important that would be ways to accelerate around the normal process as long as you're not cutting into their technical review part. Yeah. Um, oh, again, that's the, you know, I, I do not uh, uh, know their internal processes and procedures. I do know it involves, when we submit a permit to the Army Corps, it involves more than just the Army Corps. National Fish and Wildlife get involved. And when I say the Army Corps, I don't mean the group that does our beach nourishment. I mean the Jacksonville office who does regulatory permitting. But, and I, and I those, um, you know, uh, yellow um, stars, that's that's part of something else I'm going to talk about is is it is going to involve the beach renourishment side because we are trying to find that public purpose to help reduce the cost of this project. So um, permitting is, is really the key here because then we go through our bid and our contract approval process. The dredging itself is only three months. It's a very, very easy project from a you know, from an implementation perspective, it's a very easy project to do. It's just challenging and time-consuming to get there. And when, when do, would you suspect or expect to know um, when that would happen as far as um, um, the cost, you know, finding a use for that? For that? Probably with the first 
request for additional information from the regulatory agencies, that will give us a clue as to whether or not this is something they're going to accept. Now, like I said, we have been in touch with them every step of the way, and we have already posed this question. We were not gonna submit permits, applications, for something that we knew they did not support. Um, DEP um, said that, you know, again, so long as the criteria are met, they have no problem with the concept and gave us several other areas of the state where what we're proposing to do is being done on a routine basis. Army Corps said so long as it meets and fulfills all of the technical requirements, they would not be opposed to it. So again, it's, it's the devil's in the detail, I guess. I understand. So it's, it's heading in the right direction. It is. Where the cost would be a, lo a lot less, but we won't know until what part, you, know, you just don't really know. And that's a federal or a state? Both. Okay. It's both. But again, that's like I saying, having those conversations up front, having those meetings, we had a lot of Zoom meetings with those entities and all of them together in the same place because we didn't want to talk to DEP and have them say one thing and the Corps saying another thing. We were all at the table right. together, yeah, including great. National Fish and Wildlife. We, we were all in the, Zoom, in the Zoom meeting together so that everybody was hearing the same thing. Okay, okay thanks, Kelly. All right, so this is, I'm gonna, okay, big caveat here, all right, don't look at these costs as if this is the be all to end all. This is our best, our best information right now, and it's one methodology for assessment. As you know, we've, been, we've talked about um, these types of projects, our, our current county policy is that it's by assessment. All right, so, um, based on the information that we have right now, and uh, again, a lot of this goes to what we're hoping will be permitted. So we did a worst case estimate, basically saying the regulatory agencies do not support what we're proposing to do at all, and we have to find an alternative disposal methodology, or they agree with us and um, are supporting what we're doing. And so th there's, a big, there's a big difference between those two numbers. Um, the county funded the feasibility study outright, um, which led into the design and permitting, which would, which, if the assessment moves forward, would be part of the cost uh, to the property owners. And then the construction costs are inclusive of um, construction inspection and, and all of those things. So you see those total assessment costs. Um, so worst case scenario would be the entirety of the cost at about 3.18 million. Best case scenario, um, 585,000. And again, that's based on the beneficial reuse of that material. And then the five year maintenance estimate. And the reason why I have a star there is because what we're proposing to do is actually permit a federally, um, a federal borrow area. All right, so what that would mean is when the Army Corps of Engineers comes in to nourish past a grill. This could be one of the approved sand borrow areas um, for that project going forward. So as every time past a grill is nourished, they could come here and get sand. Um, that area, that sand trap area will be cleaned out. It'll, material that goes in there will be the newer, more modern sands and could then be used as part of this project. So the, the potential is that there may not be a five-year maintenance estimate because it would be rolled into a federal project. Um, so there's some really good benefits to, to when I say best case estimate, um, you know, there's, you know, one, it, it, the costs are much lower, but two, there may not be any future costs if, if we are able to permit this as part of the federal project. All right, so we, we looked at the funding options. Um, you know, uh, the Army Corps, you know, weighed in multiple times um, that there's no federal interest in this project. Uh, they, um, Paso Grill is the federal channel. They maintain and they operate Paso Grill channel. That is their channel. Um, this, this is more of a local channel that supports the property owners that live in and around there. Um, state grant programs, again, are more for uh, larger, net, larger systems that um, are more, I don't want to say public, but um, areas that are more um, generally used by the public versus the folks that more live in and around the area. Kelly, um, on, that, on that point, um, it's, and just 
talking to a few folks that live there, they were talking about having to pay a state fee for, what, what is that fee for and what, what has it collected and are those kinds of fees available? Now you say there's no state grant programs, but are those kind of fees available for this kind of work? No, no, they, what they're paying is a sovereign submerged land lease. Um, you know, the state is the owner of the bottom land um, and they're, so they're paying to lease that and then those dollars go back into the um, Board of Trustees Internal Improvement Trust Fund and then those, those funds are used to fund various state activities including the operating budget of the Division of Lands, um, but those, those revenues are not shared back with local governments. So they wouldn't be eligible for this kind of? No. Mm -mm. The other question was raised, just so while we're off on state, is you know you get a um, um, you have a, a, a license fee, you know you pay a state license. Again, the amount of the money we get back from that license doesn't even begin to cover even the cost of our sheriff's water resources. It's a very small amount, and so and and we cannot increase that um, without a approved state um, approval uh, for uh, for for doing that, and of course, that would be a, a statewide issue, so uh, very unlikely. Excuse me. Commissioner Flowers. I'm done. Go ahead. Good morning. So that was one of my questions, um, because I recall there was the issue um, when the University of South Florida wanted to purchase some lands, and the submerged lands belonged to the city. <clears throat> so I want to make sure I'm understanding you correctly. The state owns the submerged lands. The tenants or the people, the homeowners along the, this canal pay a lease. Correct. To the state. Those dollars go to a fund that's used for other things, not for the upkeep of their submerged lands. The, the state, um, again, in working with them to better understand those dollars, um, the state is not legally obligated to maintain the bottom lands. They became owner of the sovereign submerged land by, just by statehood. I mean, that's how that came to be. Um, there is no um, obligation to maintain for navigation. They are just simply the, the owner of the bottom lands. And those residents or, and the marina have paid a sovereign submerged land lease back to the state to use that land for docks and other, other private facilities that are on state lands. Um, but those dollars, yes, go back into the state's um, trust fund and are, are used to um, operate those departments, including the state division of lands and, and that, that operate the Sovereign Submerged Land Program. So. Maybe that's something we need to see if one of our legislators want to submit or suggest a bill that would rectify that because that, to me, doesn't make sense. If I own submerged lands. If I own land, I'm responsible for the upkeep of it. I'm not saying that they control the weather, certainly not, but it's theirs and you have people who are paying into a fund where they don't even reap benefits. That's like a bad landlord. <laughs> it is a bad landlord. So yeah. I'm strongly suggesting that maybe, Brian, if you're listening, that maybe we look at that as one of our initiatives um, going forward. Um, you stated earlier that there would be um, that you would need to assess what the additional potential uses for the sand that you would dredge would be, potential uses by the county. What would be some of those uses and what would deter us from utilizing any of that sand since it's shifting from one area to another? The last bullet on here um, uh, talks about the design alternatives that maximize the beneficial reuse of that material. And so our proposal, um, once we got a, a good understanding of the quality of that material and we feel that it um, meets the regulatory requirements um, that are, are covered with regard to beach renourishment, I'm gonna use a term, it's called template, but if you were doing a roadway project, it would be the design plans, so the nourishment template for Passagrill. Um, we are proposing to put this material within the design, the, the permitted and approved design for Passagrill. That is the public per use of that material. Um, if, if we use that as part of the Passagrill nourishment project, then it, it could be funded you know, by 
our funds that we use for beach nourishment. Um, not all of it, correct. Some of the There's, sand is not a, the quality, so it's yeah. the portion that they can reuse. Correct. So that's why there is some cost in the what we showed in the in the previous slide with regard to the assessment is one is that the design and permitting costs are are in there, and two, their portion of the construction uh, because some of the material does not meet um, the re the requirements for nourishment. So, but it's a, it's a small percentage when you look at the entirety of the project. Right. And, right. and um, do you think you may be able to get us copies of any of the aerial photos that the sheriff just took prior to Tuesday's meeting, if, that, if they're available? Oh, um, yeah, I will. Uh, I do believe they're delivering it on a, um, on a drive because it's video, but um, I'm sure we can get that available, get that to you. It may show a significant difference from your slide five. You said that slide was from 2015? Um, that was a compilation of 2015 through 2019. Um, the actual design of the project includes a recent survey. So obviously, yes, Elsa just came through and, and there may be some additional material there, but uh, we did accommodate for that in the design that there might be some increase um, you know, that occurs between the time of us, some, you know, getting the permit in the, in the portal for consideration and actually dredging. So we took that into account. Thank you. I'm just, I'm really just stuck on persons who purchase property that's waterway property because, and this is not anything on you or your department. You're doing a wonderful job. But I'm just really stuck on people purchasing property for a specific reason because they have a boat. They build a dock and they have davits because they want to put their boat in the water. The way for them to access that is through this canal, but they're prohibited from accessing it by natural occurrences, which is the silting or sifting of sand flow. While we're on that, though, and you're talking about state resources, our, our state representatives have said that they will certainly um, put in for a federal grant, I mean, for a state grant at next year's budget cycle. So. It isn't, you know, they're, they're kind of waiting on this, regardless of the issue about changing state policy, um, you know, and, and them accepting responsibility, uh, which would be obviously a major, um, you know, shift in policy. The, uh, I, I, I do believe that, you know, we'll, we'll work towards and try to get as much state money as possible. We just needed to have, you know, kind of the design done and to be able to make that ask. Um, but again, that'll be subject to you know, the state's budget process. My last question for now, um, I may have some later. So um, I believe previous conversations or maybe from speakers or emails, um, the other alternative or additional alternative would be to assess the abutting property owners. So for the dredging of this canal, if that is the case, do we have any dollar value yeah. per a budding property owner. That's, yeah, so that's that's, that's um, shown here. Um, uh, and again, so you can see we've got basically, again, I don't want to commit to this, and, the, and I'm saying this publicly because this is one assessment methodology, and we are looking at other assessment methodologies. This assessment methodology simply looks at linear frontage of waterfront. All right, so we kind of categorize the condos because they're very different. Some of the condo properties are really small. Some of them are, are larger. So, um, so we've got, you know, three categories of condos and, and you know, some, at what, some estimated ballpark costs if, if worst case and, and best case. And then we've got single family residential. Again, same thing. We've got some single family residential properties that have very, very long waterfront widths and some that are very small. So the spread in cost is very different. And then we have the marina who of course has the largest um, waterway frontage. And so this is one methodology and these are kind of giving you an idea of what the cost could be, um, both worst case and best case using just this methodology. But now, we are looking at others. Getting Kelly to put up figures is, is a challenge. Why? Because think about all of the different things that can change as she works with these regulatory agencies and whether we can reuse the sand and how much of that sand we can reuse and all of it outside of our control. But, but I understand the residents' concern is, you know, 
how much is this going to cost me? You know, I mean, and and whether they agree or disagree with the, the concept of the assessment, just trying to trying to ballpark that figure. Um, so we heard the residents' concerns. We are looking at alternative assessment methods. I personally discussed this with the marina, you know, and because I think the residents made a really um, you know, strong argument that the commercial traffic and the amount of use of the marina compared to, you know, individual property owners, you know, is significant. But we also have to follow state-approved methodologies for doing an assessment. Um, and so we, we've looked at that through the county attorney's office. We've looked at, at various things. I had a conversation with the marina talking about their business interest and we're going to continue to look at alternatives and we're going to continue to engage with the marina um, as we as we narrow down the exact uh, project that we have. We have time while they're going through the regulatory process. We're going to continue to have all those types of discussions. I appreciate that because I fully understand, you know, by you know, if they are assessed, you're paying for something that others reap the benefits of and they're not having to. So I would be a little upset about that as well. Well, and, and I, I do want to hit one point because they say, well, I don't have a boat, okay? But if, if you have the ability to have a boat under state approved guidelines, before we could assess that um, in any other method, you have to, in essence, take and look at the uh, what would be permitted if they built out everyone to the maximum amount, a number of docks based upon the zoning and everything. You would have to you have to build that out because they could, and, and factor that into your assessment if we if we went by that, versus just linear feet. So, it, I, and I, I understand the concerns of some of the residents, but again, we have to follow state approved methodologies for doing that. So if we look at that option, we would have to do that process before we could do that assessment by doc, and so it's it's very convoluted and, and uh, complex. But yeah. we're looking at all, all different options. So, so Kelly, just on that point, um, if you have tw a 20-unit condo complex that's 10 stories high and has so many lineal feet along the, or a condo association that's 20 units on two stories and they're spread out, um, are the folks that have the longer lineal square footage along going to get assessed more than somebody that's in a high rise um, because of the lineal footage along the Well, yeah, it, well, that particular methodology is completely tied to linear water, the linear frontage on the waterfront. It has nothing to do with the number of units on the property. Okay, okay so, so the lineal footage of the unit itself, not the property. It's not of the, the property. Of the yes, property, of the so. property. So basically, you know, if if there, you know, is 200 linear feet, um, in this case, you see we have, um, you know, a, a, a worst case or let's um, best case of about $35 per linear feet. You multiply the linear feet by that number and then you divide it equally amongst the condos. That is one methodology. It's not, it's, we're yeah. look, Barry mentioned one, it's, it's called water use. And we are, um, you know, we have finished that analysis and we'll be getting with Barry to talk about you know, that option there. We've been working with the attorney's office on all the various options that are available to us with regard to assessment and what is what is the most equitable way to do this project. And what we've also focused on is trying to get the cost down, you know, yeah, yeah, per, yeah. per residence. I also want to say something because that, you know, if whatever method we come up with and depending upon, you know, the number between best case and worst case, we can set up a way of doing that over a few years, like they, you know, expect, and you know, and, and maybe even giving people options. So we're we're looking at that also to where, you know, you don't have to write a check day one for that. Maybe it's done over two or three years or some, and so those options are also available that we're looking at. But we wanted to kind of figure out is it more towards the best case scenario or more yeah. towards the worst case scenario before we make that yeah. determination. And these, these, these issues that you're talking about are probably the most important ones is how we're going to get the overall cost down versus some of the other things. But it, w it strikes me that a two-story condo uh, units are probably a lot less expensive than a 10-story high-rise mm -hmm. units, and yet those folks will be hit a lot less than those folks that have the, the lower less expensive because you're not doing it by property value, you're doing it by lineal feet Correct. along the canal. And it, it, it just seems a disproportionate 
they're, thinking they're, to what we're yeah. talking about. But I'm sure we'll consider. We, and, and I don't know if you have a slide in there talking about you know places that use different methods. Um, I think you do, but you know there we we have to go by approved I processes. This is very very common throughout the state of Florida on how they do dredge projects and how they do that assessment. Gotcha. So whether uh, we agree or disagree, and I'm, I'm sure there's going to be pros and cons to to each option, but. We're, we're continuing to look at the various options. So this is okay. this is to put it out there, to kind of bracket it, uh, knowing that there's a lot more work to do. Got it, okay. So just going back to the, the funding options and close out this slide, um, you know, I know we, we had a conversation, this board, and we had a, a work session and back in October of 2019 and, and talked about dredging. Um, and that cr our current policy is, is that we utilize a non-ad valorem assessment process for, for these types of navigation projects. Our ordinance, um, Chapter 110, was, was updated to reflect that, and that then costs are shared um, to the specially benefiting property owners. So just a little history on, uh, on that part of it. And um, then we, again, the use of other public funding and, and making sure that the use is the, the appropriateness of the use, um, but also looking beyond this particular project. Um, we have a lot of requests for navigational dredge. So um, decisions that are, are made on this project may impact other requests going forward. And the, and the cost to change that policy would be significant. And so we'd be taking on something that I would need a funding source for. We're gonna present the budget next Tuesday. Um, it does not have a program for navigational dredges in there. Um, and so to change that, um, we would have to do that for in anywhere within the county, and that would have a significant cost and need an appropriate funding source uh, for that. Okay. So these are the various funding options for assessments oh, that we've been looking at. Um, you know, the one, one there at the top is probably the least popular, which is just everybody pays the same. You know, there's a total cost. It's divided equally amongst all the property owners, and everybody pays the same. Um, it's you know it's an it's a very simple methodology, but um, you know equitable is, is you know at least from the property owner's perspective is is probably not uh, probably not very popular. Property values um, we talked about this methodology. The county attorney's office has advised us against that methodology. Water access is the methodology that Barry just talked about, and and we are um, develop we are de pulling pushing that out as far as our analysis and everything. And for those of you who are very familiar with stormwater utilities, it kind of follows that methodology. You develop an equivalent residential unit, and, and you use that methodology to calculate the assessment. And then what you saw in the chart there is the linear frontage feet, and that's used by Hillsborough and Fort Lauderdale. Um, but we are looking at um, you know these methodologies. Um, these are the, the ones that are out there that, that are used that um, even a lot in Florida. So you notice the property value has uh, not been used in Florida, so the others are Florida specific. A question, um, yeah. does, does that water access relate to um, use as well? Like for instance, if I own a place, I'm gonna be out on the boat once a week. So I have technically 52 uses a year. I'm just, I'm, again, just trying to be, it it's, versus a marina that might have you know, more. Um, the, the methodology that we're using to evaluate that is, is through our code, and it's based on slips, okay. the number of slips you can have. So okay. and in this particular case, uh, the single family property is the basis, the foundation of it, and a single family property can have two slips. So okay. that is the foundation of it. And then obviously, the more slips you're permitted to have, you know, the more ERUs you might have generally. But we'll get, we'll get with Barry on that because, I mean, ultimately, once an assessment methodology is the approved methodology that we move forward with, obviously that is the methodology that we then carry through the costs right. and we formally petition the community, each property owner individually. All right, so you know the staff recommendation here is is a combination is one as much as possible uh, the beneficial reuse um, use as much of this material as possible 
in support of the Paso Grill Nourishment Project. And then the remaining um, amount of that uh, assessed to the specially benefiting property owners. Um, and again, Barry mentioned this, but just to be very clear that um, it can be collected over multiple years um, if, if there is a preference for that. And then there's just a layout of, um, there's 116 single family residential, one commercial, which of course is the marina, and there's 30 condo complexes comprising of over 400 units. And that is all I have for you. Okay, uh, Commissioner Justice. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have a few random questions on the, the construction cost, 2.95 million. That's actually the dredge, right? We're not actually constructing any kind of jetties or anything like that. That's just the actual physical dredging. Correct. And, and what portion of that is the carrying away the sand? Um, probably about half. Half. I mean, mobilization is is expensive in these types of jobs. Um, yeah. you know, it just is. So mobilization is is pretty high, and then about half of the rest of it um, is the material. Now, again, if if the regulatory agencies agree, we aren't carrying off sand. We are essentially. Um, we have, it's just like beach renourishment. I know a lot of you have been out on the beaches and seen that process where we would uh, basically dredge it from the channel and, and basin three, and we would pump it up to Paso Grill, just like any other nourishment project. Yeah, it, was, it made me think of the, the Lake Seminole dredge about, they were talking about another project that was double the cost because they didn't have that site like we do adjacent to the lake. Yeah. Um, okay, well, that's, that's an important part of the question. The, when we're talking about the um, properties that are being potentially assessed, we talked about the condos and the single family residences, and we talked about the marina. When we say the marina, does that include that entire, the restaurant, the hotel, all of that, even though some of that's in unincorporated and some of that's in the city of St. Petersburg? Well, yeah, it, it, we're, we're doing both. Um, it doesn't matter unincorporated or incorporated within the city of St. Petersburg. Our, our authority as the Water Navigation Control Authority and our charter allows us to do that. Okay. And the, 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 um, mer the, the boat docks at the hotel um, are owned by the marina. So. So, okay. And we are looking not just at the wet slips, we are also considering the dry slips. Okay. Um, the, the fuel, when boats fuel up at the marina, is that paying in our typical gas tax or is that I'm sure in some way it is because every every type of fuel has a, a tax on it. But again, the uh, uses of that money, um, you know, are restricted. Sure, but it, it opens that, I mean, this is very, I mean, obviously nitty gritty, we have a, a rubber hits the road kind of project here, but it, it brings up a lot of more global questions about how we fund things and what we're responsible for. And, and so um, it, it makes me think about that uh, uh, navigation and what responsibility do we have? And that would bring my last question is, what other projects have we done in the last five, 10 years? Because obviously this is getting a lot of attention, but I was trying to remember another project since I've been on that, that we had the same kind of scenario. Before you answer that, I want to I address the issue like with the gas tax. Because people also say, well, I, because I, I pay more property tax because I'm on the water, which is true. Um, you know, a lot of that goes to schools and stuff. But if we take it from somewhere else, then then how are you going to fund the programs that are currently going off of what we use the, the current funding for? So I, I get that they pay into that gas tax, but we already know that we don't have sufficient money within the Transportation Trust Fund. And, and I don't, I'm saying this more for the public because I get that question a lot, and I'd have to cut that program. <laughs> you know, and so there's, there's, I mean, I think it's valid arguments sometimes, um, but, but we, the, the reality is that we're trying to reduce our cost um, and our operating budget and our general fund, um, I, I don't see anybody, you know, we're really trying to hold that, the line on that. And so those, those mon whatever funding sources we have, they're, they're used. And, our, and, our, and the real issue is that if we open this up and we change that, uh, then, you know, we've got we've to we've pay for that somehow. Oh, absolutely. And it's like, again, it's, it is a, a bifurcation of you have the actual need today and then all of that precedent setting decision making that we're thinking about doing 
how that affects us tomorrow in, in 10 years. But yeah. to me, it's an interesting question of, of we're paying a tax on that, which traditionally goes to roads. And then do we think of this as a navigational way? You know, and that's, I mean, we, we're thinking of a lot of it as, as a, uh, a amenity for, yeah. you know, nice homes on the water. But if we're looking at it as a navigational way, then it, it just brings up a whole other way of looking at it. That's it would all. be it would be a huge endeavor, and that would be a major change in policy. I'm not saying it's right or wrong. It's it's that would be a major change in policy that we would take on a maintenance responsibility. We have that uh, in other areas. We have that just to the south, um, that the the, boat, the owners along uh, along that drive lost ac you know boat access um, with that. Um, but we also have you know, and I think we brought this to you in 2019. Um, other areas where people feel that we should take ownership responsibility, maintenance responsibility, and drainage waste too, um, you know, and so these these are both significant issues with significant cost impacts. I mean, millions um, annually you know, that would be, you know, we would need to put resources into that. Absolutely. And then if you could answer my question about when the last time we had a similar situation. I don't have the exact uh, dates on me. We dredged. Um, McKay Creek um, from pretty much Indian Rocks Road all the way to the intercoastal for the Harbor Hills subdivision. Um, right before COVID, they actually um, started another inquiry to, to do that one again. Um, we did uh, assessment dredging up in, um, oh shoot, what's the name of that? Uh, it's a mobile home park. Jewel, do you remember <laughs> off the top? I can't really think of it. There's a, a mobile home park not too far north there. It's a kind of unincorporated seminal. Um, park Neves uh, uh, subdivision is on the south side of it, and there's a mobile home park on the on the north side of it, and we dredged that area by assessment. And that's, um, when you say assessment, we did a, a linear footage, or we did a... <clears throat> Yes, we did not use the non avalorum assessment process in that case. Um, the, that, that particular case, it, it was, um, the methodology was the same, but it, it was basically a bill was sent to them and they had to pay in. Um, it was more challenging to collect those fees, which is why going forward into the future, the, the ordinance was updated to utilize the non avalorum assessment process. Um, we've also had requests up in Palm Harbor um, where the Crosswinds Westwinds bridge project is going on right now. Um, that particular um, canal, uh, we didn't end up going forward with a navigational project because of soil sediment contamination issues. Um, so it was recommended that uh, we not move forward with an assessment dredge on that project. Um, so those are the three that come to mind. Seahorse Mobile Home Park. Thank you, Jewel. Seahorse Mobile Home Park. You, you can thank Brendan. Oh, <laughs> thank you, Brendan. So, great minds. Seahorse, right. is that uh, the Bay Pines area? Yeah, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, all yeah. right. Thank you. Commissioner Long. Yes, uh, Kelly, <clears throat> just a few things. I'm very curious about the, and I think you if memory serves me correctly, had a gold star by this one, the precedent issue that we are creating here. And it brings me to another thought that it's curious to me how we go about making decisions what we, about what we'll do, what we won't do, and or what we can't do. And I say that because I'm thinking about the canals, for example, the Cross Bayou group that has been surfacing here recently, there since the time I've been on the commission, there have been several homeowners association. In fact, I used to live in one that had several uh, canals that were built when the subdivision was originally created. But over the years, they've never been dredged and they are filling up with muck on the bottom. So you know that it's only a matter of time before that's gonna cause us a stormwater management issue as the flow into, and I do believe it goes into Lake Seminole, gets ha hindered in any kind of a way. And we have the Johns Pass issue that we are continuing to work on and now we have the Grand Canal, which we've been talking about for several years. So one of the 
entities that I did not hear you talk about in terms of having an involvement in the permitting or stakeholder issue was the Coast Guard. Are they involved in any of this at all? I mean, don't they have jurisdiction somewhere? Um, mostly with regard to safety. And actually, one of the things um, that we just had to do, uh, if, if you've been down there recently, you saw uh, one of the channel markers is actually 75 feet high and dry and it's sitting up there. So we worked with the, the Coast Guard to decommission that navigation marker. So, I mean, the piling is still there. Um, they determined it was not a safety issue. It's, it is high and dry. But we took down the signs. Um, and they told us to leave it in place if, um, because if this assessment, if this project moves forward, then you know we would recommission that, that uh, marker. So more from a safety and navigational safety perspective is, is their role. And they also, um, you know, all of our aids to navigation are permitted, you know, through the Corps. I mean, through the, excuse me, through the Coast Guard, they're part of that review process and when they see things that need repair and stuff like that, lots of feedback. So there's lots of coordination with the Coast Guard with regard to how we operate and maintain our aids to navigation. Um, they also have their own aids to navigation that they maintain, um, specifically the intercoastal waterway, but sometimes where our two channels meet, um, there's a, we, we need to have a lot of coordination there. So, and then to Commissioner Justice's comments about the way in which we fund things, um, it is important to keep in mind, I think, that Forward Pinellas, which several of us serve on, has established a new committee that deals with waterborne transportation. And in that regard, we have a several commercial waterborne transportation opportunities within our county and our region that are surfacing and have surfaced over the last couple of years. So how we fund those going forward, my understanding is in the new infrastructure package that's being talked about in DC right now, there are dollars there for waterborne transportation. And I think those conversations, as Commissioner Justice alluded to, could be very timely and important as we go forward to assess how do we pay for these things that we are dealing with in 2021 that we know are gonna be ongoing for decades probably, given that we are a county that is surrounded on three sides by water? I mean, I think that really boils down to public health and safety issues at some point, just in terms of how we move around. I don't know if anybody else is thinking the same way, but. I mean, I, I think you've got, to, you've got to bear that also with what is an individual property owner's responsibility. Um, you know, you've got associations, they've got, um, they've got a canal that they've created. Um, you know, does somebody up in Mid-County want, want us to increase property taxes to be able to manage those and take that on as a public program? Uh, these are significant dollars. And, and it's not right or wrong, it's what are we willing to pay for? Um, you know, um, through general use versus doing assessments and things like that. Um, up in John's Pass, you got a private property owner that has sand that's clogged his business. Um, but it, that's the same it, issue we're dealing <laughs> with at the Grand Canal in some regards. Well, not, it, well, yes and no. Yes, yes, and yes, no. We're, yes, we're doing this as a, there. There, it's even it's up against their property. The main channel is clear, um, but you know the main channel is 14 feet deep. Um, so your point and, that you brought up, Mr. Chair, if I might, is very significant because it's not just a matter of what do the people on the Grand Canal want, it's a matter of what are they willing to pay for correct. and what's the whole county willing to subsidize? Because I may be wrong, but we do specific things down there. Aren't we going to be required to... I don't know how many well, other areas of the county may we be required to do a similar thing. But that's, Kelly, we would know better. That's, but that's the issue. If I right, get it. Right now, right now we get some request because it's through an assessment process. If we say that there's a public um, and a funding program for that, I'm sure we will get many, many more requests. 
Um, and so we'd have to be prepared for the precedent that would set. Um, I asked Kelly to give me a, a number and she, you know, hem and hauled and ignored me forever um, on giving her a number because we don't know what that would be. Well, know? just look at this project, our $3.18 million, worst case scenario, because we don't know the, where we're gonna put it, that is 60,000 cubic yards of material. That's it, 60,000 cubic yards of material. That is a drop in the bucket when it comes to dredge projects. The Lake Seminole dredge project, we removed 900,000 cubic yards of material at a tune of 20 million, right? It's, it's highly variable and how we dredge, I mean, these types of projects are extremely expensive and then, you know, if you're dealing with material that, you know, one, cannot be placed on a beach um, or cannot, or has to be landfilled, um, like the one up in um, Palm Harbor, uh, that, that sediment was, it wasn't a huge amount of sediment, but it was contaminated with arsenic, which meant we had to truck it all the way down to Manatee County to an approved landfill, which took costs like astronomical. It, oh. So it's, you know, the, you know, the, the diversity of, I, I couldn't really, I mean, to Barry's point, I can't really put a number on it because there's just so many variables that you can't account for in specific locations. But at the end of the day, Mother Nature can come along and just that's exactly right. Puff it all away, mm -hmm. regardless of what we do, right? Absolutely. I mean, that's the that's the challenge of living on a peninsula on a peninsula, right? And I would say, you know, Commissioner Long, we our, our northern border also has the Anclote River, so you could say that we're surrounded by water on well, four sides. That's just so. another one. Yep, sure is. So um, it it just. You know, you guys are, you, yeah. it, what do we do with all this? I mean, but to, to the point that I, I brought up earlier, you know, we do have countywide authority over water navigation programs, and that's how we're allowed, how we can pull the city of St. Petersburg incorporated pro, um, parcels into this project. But the city of St. Petersburg also has a navigational dredging program for their canals in and around, and they use the assessment process widely if, if people come in and ask for it. Um, you know, so there's. And, and, and you say there's so many variables, and this one has a public piece to it as well. Not only the homes that live there, but the, the business that's at the end of the canal, yeah. which well, is. Well, the public the, piece is how we can use the non avalorum right. assessment process right. in the first place. If this were serving nothing more than just re residential homes, you know, we, we might be a little challenged to find that public component to this project. You need to reuse the to actually do the project utilizing the non ad valorem assessment process, which requires that linkage to a public use, a public purpose. And, and being part of the preserve, is that part of the connection as well? I mean, no, it's, it's mainly that, you know, we have, a, we have commercial business in there that people do come up and, and get gas, like you mentioned, and they go to the restaurants. And so that mm -hmm. public component of it you know, ties heavily into the ability to make that public connection and utilize this process. Okay. So if it was ex just exclusively residential, then? It would be challenging to find that public component to it. Now we have in the past because in some cases, some of the channels, when they fill in, the ultimate stormwater outfall is at the head of that. And if it's impacting local drainage, then that's how we can tie, and that's McKay Creek is one of those, where there's a large culvert that goes under Indian Rocks Road, and so if you know sediment is impacting the ability of that water to convey through, um, you can tie that public purpose to it because there's a, a larger um, picture there. Um, but if it were just, we want our canal deeper, and there was nothing else to it, um, I would have to confer with the county attorney's office as to whether or not that, that test, that checkbox is there. Okay. Um, the only other thing I would ask is that, that um, on your time schedule there, you said on 623 you had submitted, showing they're submitting to the federal, has that already happened? It actually did not. That was, when I submitted this, that was the plan. Um, 
because they needed to do an extra model run, and this is, again, goes to the Army Corps of Engineers very specifically, um, they needed to do another model run to dredge that sand area eight feet deep um, and make sure, you know, that that um, it met, it met all their, there were no issues with that, so there was an extra model run that they had to finish up. So that's that delayed us a, a week or so, but. Um, but our intent is to submit the yep, yep, at this it, one. Yeah. If it, if we can move these timelines up, we'll move these timelines up. Um, you know, and she'll work with continue to work with state and federal agencies and and push as hard as we can yeah. um, to move the, the project the, along. And the key piece here is that there's different decision points. It seems like on what we're going to be doing and how are we going to be getting that public input along the way as we do these different decision points. We specifically, I was specifically asked if they could speak today, and I said I couldn't figure out a way to get a representative or two to speak on behalf of everybody, because this is primarily for our benefit to try to understand Correct. the process a little better. But at some point, there's a lot of things here that we are going to need some additional. Um, yeah, we've we've pushed the petition process out a little bit so that we can get a little, again, look more at all the assessment methodologies and then get a recommendation uh, approved by this body to, yes, this is the methodology that we want to use uh, for the process because that would tie directly into onto the costs. Um, the other piece of it, of course, is the regulatory agencies, and we got to know what they're going to do. Um, we'll know what the state's going to approve first, and that'll be a good indicator because they do work hand in hand with the Army Corps of Engineers and National Fish. They aren't permitting in, a, in silos; they do compare notes. Um, so, if we get some, you know, positive feedback um, from the state, which we will first, they have de deadlines. That'll give us some some confidence right. in, in the direction that we're going. And at that point in time, we would be recommending um, to petition to, we'd bring, have to come back, make sure that um, every everything is agreed upon because then we would send out the petition notice to every single property owner and that would give them essentially their max rate. All right, so it could be less than that, but it wouldn't be more than that. Right. And then the process would be that, you know, well, our policy is, it's not its not in, in stone, is that we would want 60% of the property owners to agree to the assessment as proposed to them. Now, we're going to have a public component piece to Correct. this. So we're going to yeah, do outreach mm -hmm. um, with um, the community and have opportunities for public meetings and, um, and hear their comments and concerns and ideas um, immediately following this process in the fall. Yeah, and, yeah, and yeah. We, are, we do have a meeting next week um, with some of the, the TVCA association members um, to kind of go over all of this. Again, it's always our intent to bring this information to you first right. uh, before that gets out to well, um, I, I certainly the think conference. along the way those critical points and letting people know when we need them to engage and yeah. the opportunity. So th otherwise, they're just going to be venting frustrations along mm -hmm. the way instead of if they don't have places to really give significant input before decisions are made. Correct. Um, mm -hmm. I think that's going to be yeah. really important to get out there. Um, it, it is. And, and and I I do under, and we had a couple of residents of state after at, the, at our last meeting and we talked to them afterwards and, you know, they were raising concerns of things that we hadn't put out yet. And I'm like, well, okay, first, you know, we always try to tell our bosses before we tell, <laughs> we go public with ideas, but Kelly's been working so hard because if, if we can reuse that sand, yeah. that, that changes the numbers significantly. And, and so that was a key piece before we go out to the residents because obviously what they want to know is how it's going to hit their pocketbook, yeah. um, you know? And so um, trying, to, trying to pull these different pieces together when we don't control the answers out of the state and federal government is, you know, which comes first. And so um, I understand the concern and the confusion, um, but we're, we're there now. She's boxed it. We put this stuff today, and now we're going to go to out to the public and have several opportunities for uh, them to ask questions, offer ideas as we kind of bring bring this project. You know. So, so do I? Did I also hear you say that the the piece of uh, you know that we might be able to not only assess but to spread that payment out over time, Correct. much like we do if we put meters in. They, they don't have to pay it up front. They can pay it over 10 years, five years, whatever. We got so to look at Based that. on the timeline, the assessment actually wouldn't start until after construction was done. So we would, we would know 
all of our costs. And yes, the, I mean, really that, I mean, one, they will provide the feedback on what, what they would like to see, but ultimately this board makes the decision on on how many years that gets okay. so spread be, out. Okay, so that'd be mm -hmm. our, our decision here. Commissioner Long? Yes, I would like to suggest, uh, because I clearly remember that several years ago, we did one of our, our meetings down at Tampa Bay Watch on Tierra Verde. And I'm looking at this timeline of December 23rd here. It seems to me that we might be well positioned sometime in January to do a, one of our meetings down in Tierra Verde and that way all the citizens would be able to come and we'd be able to hear their concerns or whatever and we're looking at a number of mechanisms to hold a meeting. I mean, obviously that um, we haven't received confirmation that uh, Tampa Bay Watch is, is having meetings of, of that extent like we had in the past. I mean, we had I think, well over 150, 200 people packed oh, yeah, into that room. Um, and with, uh, you know, distant, you know, social distancing recommendations, um, you know, we were trying to figure out if we could kind of do a dual meeting, you know, some in person or some virtually, or we just schedule a series of meetings um, and say, you know, we can do, you know, 50 people at a time and, and schedule them out. So we're all the same information is, is presented. And, and the challenge there is, obviously I'd like everybody to be there at once because then they hear all the same things. And somebody over here on, on Monday may ask a question that the folks on Tuesday don't get to hear the answer to. Right. So uh, as much as possible, we're gonna try to coordinate a, a you know, one collaborative meeting or a combination thereof that allows us to accommodate the number of people that will want to be present or participate. Well, if it's not at Tampa Bay Watch, there are plenty of huge uh, ballrooms on St. Pete Beach where we could have something potentially. Just a suggestion. Yeah, we did. We did look at Eckerd College because they have a um, a large facility, but they are not allowing um, any off campus folks in at this time. So we are we are looking. Commissioner Gerard. Actually I had a question for Jewel. So if anybody else has something. Yeah Commissioner Flowers did and okay. we'll come back to you. Um, just a question. So if we allow those payments to be broken out over time, which I support, and let's say something happens where that person either no longer owns their unit, their house, or what have you. Um, is there a lien put against their property for non-payment if, if someone, God forbid, passes away and, right. you know, the property is willed to someone? How, how would that occur? If someone does not pay the <clears throat> non-avalorum assessment, then yes, a lien would be placed on the property. Um, so that goes with the property. Yeah. And, and the only reason why I'm bringing that up is some people live on the beach, but not on, on waterfront property, but not everyone that lives there is wealthy, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Right. Mm -hmm. Some are on some fixed incomes. And so that's just a thought, you know, that I have just in having to deal with um, the city of St. Pete when they assess property owners straight across the board. If it's 10 people that live there, they divide it by 10 and that's what you get, you know. And some persons have run into some concerns because of their um, income. So that's why I asked the question. I, I don't have a problem with, you know, looking at how we assess those values, but just wanted to draw that out for some. Mm -hmm. Ms. Jules May. Commissioner Gerard <laughs> had a question. Yes, she is. Um, so not to drag this out any longer, but I'm going to. Uh, three weeks ago, we got an email or a series of emails from folks that live down there uh, containing a video that this Mr. Boomeister put out about how it's the county's responsibility and we should be paying for it and because we lease the land for the preserve from the state or whatever. Can you, I, I'm sure that's not dead yet. So would you, can you address that? I don't know if you've had a chance to look at the whole video. It's pretty Sure, long. And, I, and I will tell you, I it will freely admit, I did not watch the whole video. Um, but I will recognize Brendan Macasey on my staff who has really worked very closely with Kelly and her staff in, in sorting through all the issues that you've heard Kelly discuss here today. Um, we have a lease with the state of Florida 
um, for the Lands and Shell Key Preserve and a management plan. Those two things do not require us to do any dredging out there. I mean, really, on the contrary, we're to maintain it as a natural preserve. Um, I did ask Brendan to take a look at that issue, and he confirmed with me, you know, taking a look at the lease and the, and the management plans, that he did not believe we have any sort of legal obligation. In fact, like I said, you know, we're really required to manage this as a natural preserve, which is contrary to some of the things you heard Kelly talking about. We would have to, you know, put bulkheads and, and use some, right. you know, pretty heavy methods out there to try to open it and keep it open. Um, so really, really contrary to the plan out there. But, it, but yeah, we, we reviewed it and we do not have a legal obligation under either of, under those documents that were referred to in the video. Okay, thank you. Any? M Mr. Chair. Yes, Commissioner Law. Uh, since this is going to be an ongoing issue for a little bit, I am wondering if we might all be able to get a copy of Brendan's article that he wrote that was published in the um, Stetson University Law Review. Do you remember the one I'm talking about, Brendan? It had to do with public, the public trust doctrine as it relates to navigable waters. It seems to me that given this issue we're talking about, <laughs> I'd really like to know what your thoughts were and read the article. Kelly, uh, Brendan's here. Sorry. Brendan Mackesy, Assistant County Attorney. I'd be happy to send a PDF of the article to everyone. And yes, Commissioner Long, it concerns the public trust doctrine, navigable waters, um, how navigability works in the state of Florida. Kelly referenced the equal footing doctrine indirectly earlier, which provides that when the state of Florida uh, became a state in 1845, it was put on equal footing with other states uh, across the country. It, it gained ownership of all submerged lands that were navigable, in fact, at that time. So the article delves into the theory behind that and how that doctrine has changed over time. Um, so I'd be happy to certainly share it with everyone. And I've got a few other articles I can share as <laughs> well. Well, I'm very, very, as you know, I hope, I'm very, very interested in those issues as it pertains to protecting our environment. Mm -hmm. And so given that we are surrounded by water on all three sides, I, I would like to think that we would all have a very vested interest in reading that article. And I'm very proud of you for it, quite frankly. I was just stunned to hear that that was a big emphasis of yours. So we'll be chatting quite a bit. Yeah, thank you, Commissioner Long. I appreciate that. And an even bigger one on beach nourishment is being published by the University of Miami uh, in a few months. So I'll share that as well. Very good. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thanks. He's going to be a, a a big star here <laughs> with his own publishing company here soon. Great, um, great hire, Jewel. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Any anything else today? Okay. Um, I think we uh, we stuck. I think we're going to just. Uh, I, I was saying that if we, you know, could possibly go down the path of taking some comments, but I think we'll stick to what we did today. Uh, we're just going to have the conversation here, but it's a commission, but give some really good opportunities along the way. And I know that we'll be hearing uh, from folks their thoughts about some of the things that we've brought up today uh, mm -hmm. that they might agree with, they might disagree with. Um, I think some of the issues that Commissioner Flowers raises and some of the others that raised today about, you know, making sure that we're doing this in the, in the most fair way possible, um, finding out those cost savings that, are, mm -hmm. that will be huge, what we can do with that uh, excess um, soil, sand. fill, sand, whatever, um, you know, so what we can do with that and, we'll, and, and how that drives the cost down will be critically important. And then how, how much we can literally spread that out. I know Correct. I bought a home with a meter on it and it was a 20 year. I had 20 years to pay it back, but I went to the closing and they had forgotten to put that in there. <laughs> and they said, hold on before you sign, there's this additional little thing that <laughs> costs you 14 bucks a month for 20 years. Yeah. And um, so, I mean, well, whatever that length of time yeah. is, I'm not suggesting any length of time right now, but yeah. it does stick with the property and you clearly have Sounds a response. Sounds like you've got a deal. Yeah, and, 20 and, years. And I, I really want the <laughs> residents to know that th they're, they're not gonna be surprised about yeah. any of this. It's taken us a long time to even, I mean, when I went to the first presentation out of Tampa Bay Watch, we, we couldn't reuse the sand. 
and so you know this time and these studies have proved out you know options that weren't available at that time um, so it's it's important to have that obviously it's a permitting requirement but um, but we're gonna go we're, we're gonna make sure we continually engage the residents give them those opportunities for us to hear their concerns their thoughts or ideas um, throughout this process and so I know yeah. they haven't got a lot of information up to this point, but now we're going to start a public engagement process. They certainly can can engage, you know, with you all, and and certainly you'll be make, make, making the final decisions. But we're going to have public outreach before that. I, I, th I do think that there's going to be growing concern about the length of time between now. Like you said, it's not going to take long once we get mobilized to do it, but it seems like getting to that point is taking a long time. Now, maybe in in the uh, permitting world, it's not. Uh, but it seems like uh, you know we continue to have uh, to piggyback on the sheriff as he flies over top over the next six months and mm -hmm. it'd be nice to continue to see after we get these occurrences what you might see in terms of shifting and, and acceleration and you know emergency kind of re appeal to the different organizations mm -hmm. about getting things done ahead of time um, I mean these are critical issues um, that that affect people's lives and their property values and business property values and um, and the way we conduct business in Pinellas County so I, w I would like to acknowledge you know the community that I can't remember who said it but they said get creative and um, that was where we really just started looking at you know going into a little bit more deeper depth into the quality of the sand and then what 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 can we do with the sand does it meet the criteria I mean for for beach placement um, you know, and that's where we found out the majority of it did, but there's a component of it that doesn't. And so that's how we were like, well, what if we broke that out and we could use this piece here? And, you know, the rest of it is, is actually a very small component. It's only 12%. And that could be distributed amongst the property owners because that's not something that, that would qualify. But the overwhelming majority of it could. And, and we, again, it was one of those things, okay, now we got to call the regulatory agencies and we have to propose this and make sure that I'm not going to waste time submitting a permit application that I know they're going to deny. Um, I want them to be to give us some level of. I know they can't rule on a permit that they don't have in hand, but they can give us some guidance on on concepts that they would support or not support. And right now, they're it's on the support side. So, um, you know, we're getting creative. We're we're trying to figure out how we can best do this and and then came out the second piece of it which I know I mentioned it but I, I want to highlight it once more is that if we can get that sand trap approved as a borrow area which means I don't get a little technical here but we're going to have to update the federal NEPA which is the environmental uh, evaluation and that area gets approved as a borrow area that means the Army Corps can pull from it any time you know, to support any of the federally authorized projects. So that would mean that there would be no maintenance effort in the future. So again, that's part of our permit application. We were trying to pull this all together to make sure that um, we didn't leave any stone unturned. We were trying to get as creative as possible and trying to minimize the cost to the community um, and also find a, you know, a good positive outcome for, you know, the material. I mean. If we had to haul all this down, you know, to some offshore site for disposal, the costs were really expensive. But if we, again, we can use this for a good public benefit, then everybody wins. And so we, we, we hear what they're saying, and, and we have been taking all that into account, and in, in, as we move this project forward. So. Okay. Thanks, Kelly. Keep uh, keep us up to date on everything you learn along the way. Anything else before we let Kelly go? Okay. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you, Kelly. Okay. Great job. Thank you. I thought you were going to mention red tide, so. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. What about that? <laughs> <laughs> you, you. Uh, yeah. uh, we, we just got an agreement from DEP for $200,000. That, that'll cover what we've spent to date um, for some of the beach, beach stuff, not all of the disposal. I'm um, going to probably be calling them back to see if there's uh, any additional funding. But uh, again, big shout out to the sheriff. They have just been wonderful. So yesterday they were out there covering the beaches and getting good shots of John's Pass and the Grand Canal. I asked them to really focus on those two areas. Um, 
but they're also today right, flying right now, getting a bird's eye view of all the red tide. And so we'll we'll work with the cities to figure out if we need to re-engage the contractor or if it's localized enough that they may want to take that on themselves. But we're we're working on it. Thank you Gerard, so much, Commissioner Gerard. You had a question. Yeah, the map you sent out yesterday, or I guess it was you, or the day before. Yeah, I, about I, Tampa I forward Bay. I forward them the maps you send me. So about Tampa Bay. I mean, that looks. We haven't had that before in Tampa Bay, have we? No, it's it's precedent setting. And is there any word, any newer word about whether the um, spill in Manatee County had anything to do with that? You know, I. Yeah. I mean, you know, all the signs, the cause and effect is, is very hard. Can we say that, you know, the nutrients went in and the nutrients actually caused the red tide? No, we can't say that. But, you know, the weight of evidence is the bottom line is 215 tons of nitrogen was dumped into a, a semi-enclosed estuary that is controlled by nitrogen. The water quality in Tampa Bay is controlled by nitrogen. Right. And the more nitrogen that goes in, the more problems we have. And so, you know, those types of things are very problematic. Um, but yeah, that the the bloom in the bay is is was very concerning to everyone. Um, uh, our, our state partners, our our county partners, obviously our our city partners. Um, uh, we'll get some new imagery. We'll see how Elsa um, helped or hurt. And yeah. I was asked about 2018 when Michael came by, everybody was like, oh, this is going to be fantastic. It's going to break it all up. Oops. It didn't. It pushed it right into us and it got worse. So I, yes, it's a magic. I don't have a magic ball as to what's going to happen here. But I mean, right now we're seeing a, a lot of dead fish and obviously it's washed up into people's backyards and it's, you know, filling the canals. And so we're going to that's, that's why I asked for some air support to try to get a bird's eye view of, of what we're dealing with out there. So a couple of questions related to that. Are we doing, are we responsible to do cleanup in Tampa Bay or is it all cities that have to? We don't have a responsibility to. Um, actually in 2005, 2006, when we had a big bloom, um, it was kind of everybody did their own thing. Um, of course, our solid waste department, we did the waiver of the fish disposal, right. but each city did their own cleanup. In 2018, it was, you know, we want a countywide response, and so that's what we did. Um, this is a little different in that it's it's in Tampa Bay and it's very wind driven. So when the winds are out of the east, it's on our coast, and when it's out of the west, it's on their side. But we do have a regional red tide working group. Um, we have a meeting next week. Uh, so, but there's some different perspectives from the different counties as to whether or not we leave it or or we harvest it. Our, um, you know, we've always taken the approach that we remove it. Uh, for public health, for biz you know our businesses, um, those restaurants that are on the intercoastal waterway, they can't have people sitting in outdoor dining with their canals filled with dead fish. And then there's the environmental right. component of it too. So, so what, what's the argument for I, leaving it? I mean, just there'll be a lot of good reasons why not, why 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 we do what we do, but. Um, you know, so there's some that believe that it's just part of the natural okay. biologic process that. Okay. Um, fish die and yeah. and that's part of it but um, I, I would argue that you know hundreds of thousands well yeah. we've, we've already received two over 200 tons of dead fish at, at solid waste so I, I would argue that it's better to get that out of the system than it is to leave it yeah for our environment our business etc yes. health etc yeah and the other yeah. question related to that is for the attorney do we have any legal resource if we can make a connection between that spill and this mess in Tampa Bay? Um, I, again, Brendan will take the spotlight here. We've looked into it some. Um, it would probably be a little bit challenging because some of the causation issues that, that Kelly has talked about. But we, we have taken a look at that. Um, I did get a question from Commissioner Justice about this, and so we looked into it. I could bring forward some more um, information on that. But again, there would be some hurdles and a, a bit of a challenge. But we have we have taken a look at it. But. Oh, well. Okay. Anything else for Kelly? Okay, Kelly, better run. Quick. <laughs> All right. Barry, let's okay. go on to the ready, ready for agenda the agenda. Briefing. Yeah. All right. Um. All right. So um, on our agenda review, we have um, some presentations you can see on our first uh, uh, four items. Um, we have citizens' public comment. 
um, under the consent agenda, uh, consent agenda uh, we have a um, few items from the clerk. Um, we have a doc fee report um, and various inf um, fiscal reports that are attached. Um, item number 13, I'm gonna ask that we defer this um, item and pull it. Um, I, I wanna probably bring it back forward, but I wanna dig into some more of the detail um, before I ask for your approval on this. Um, and Barry, could you bring that, put that on the regular agenda when you do? Yes. Yeah, that, as, as opposed we, to we probably should have put this on the regular agenda. Um, whatever, it I just matter. didn't catch it. That's um, all right. We'll so I, I just have some questions I'd like to go through first. And we'll put it on the regular agenda when we bring it back. Um, item 14 is declaring surplus equipment and vehicles. Item 15 is uh, delegated items. Um, uh, and 16, item 17 is a budget amendment. Um, this budget amendment it relates to um, expenditures out of the general fund uh, for COVID related um, activities. Um, item 18. Um, as an award of bid to four contractors, this is for um, our um, uh, utilities department uh, for various jock contracts that they use for um, wastewater treatment facilities, underground utility repairs, and minor construction. Item number 19, it is an award of bid to Polydyne for reclaimed um, methanol. Um, Again, this is done through a Tampa Bay Purchasing Cooperative uh, for utilities. Uh, under item number 20, that is the monthly um, uh, notice of lawsuits received. There's one lawsuit on there. It's a trip and fall on a sidewalk. Item 21's uh, receiving file report for the Sheriff's Office, um, actually for 21 and 22. Barry, uh, could you go real quickly back to 17? That's the... Uh the reapportion, uh, realign a portion uh, of appropriation from the reserves to um, to contingency in the general fund. That was from the COVID, um, and that will be uh, eligible for reimbursement. That that money that we spend there. Uh, correct. Yes, it, th this is eligible expenses. Um, they we have to do a budget budget amendment because they incurred these costs, and this is for everything in facilities. Um, and so we'll then reimburse ourselves out of, uh, I'm not sure, Kevin, are we doing this out of CARES or, or are we gonna do this out of uh, ARP? Oh, this is FEMA? Okay, so this is a, they did a FEMA reimbursement on this. Okay, so that fund, we're just putting it into the reserve, uh, into the general fund as an expense and then we'll reimburse ourselves. That's correct, because okay. if, we don't, if we don't put that in, then they'll over, overrun their budget. I got you, okay, mm -hmm. thank you. Um, item 23 is the lead event funding. Uh, recommendations for you. Um, item number 24 is an application for Florida Growth Grant Funds, um, and this is for the Innovation Center. Um, item number 25 is the first uh, three Penny for Pinellas Employment Sites Program. Um, um, applications. Um, they actually had four. Uh, we were comfortable with three bringing forward. We're still evaluating the rest. And so these are the first three that uh, we're recommending. Question? Yeah, Commissioner. Thank you. Um, on, the, on the projects, I was glancing and it was not at the summary sheets. And um, we're paying for construction. I guess I want a better, just a better general understanding of what we're paying for. Come on what, up, Kevin. what the timeline is, uh, clawbacks, mm -hmm. for, you know, it, requirements. Because in my head, I'm looking at like comparing it to the QTI, and so I'm just trying to understand what we're paying for and what we get. In this program, we are going to be doing some construction, mostly it's site work to prepare the area for the construction of the facilities. And it'll depend on the project. You'll see in each description exactly what the funding is requested for. Um, when we do the presentation, I can make sure that we address that directly. Okay, thank you. So and, and one thing, Commissioner, keep in mind, when we um, submitted the surtax to the voters to approve, um, we did specifically limit the um, economic development funds to capital projects. So there aren't gonna be things like incentives. Right, and I, and I know that we're not doing the incentives, but if we're building someone, and that's how we always took it, was more infrastructure type things. Right. But if we're building 
if we're paying for part of the warehouse, then what's the what what's you know how it's um, to keep them from selling it tomorrow or whatever? Well, well, yeah, right. The, I, I call it clawback, but yeah. you know, right. So anyway, and, and I'll make sure they address that in the presentation. We did look at these, and I sat down with staff and went through these, and we're really trying to do this as an incentive for them to expand in these sites. So. Um, I, you know, they'll go through each one of them, but in one particular case, for them to locate here versus going out to a greenfield site over in somewhere else, um, you know, it's challenging because the site's constrained. And so us putting that investments, it kind of incentivizes them to build there and expand their operation. So we're trying to trying to make it to where we're, we're using dollars to, you know, continue our, um, our uh, people to invest right here in Pinellas County. Uh, and, and on that point, are we are we front fronting it? Or are we waiting until a, a certificate of occupancy for the project to reimburse them for that piece? So how, th how there's two it? stages that have to come after this. The first one is is we need to verify that the financial request is valid. So we're not going to do anything until we've gone through that process. What we're doing is getting permission from you to to move forward, and then we will negotiate based on the project itself and what they're doing. Um, in most cases, it's, it's site work, and so we'll want to be able to help them at the beginning of the project, probably not in advance of the construction, but at least before the CO is issued. But that's something that we can negotiate with them based on feedback that we get from you all as well. Yeah, I think it would be important to make sure that there's buy-in from them on the project mm -hmm. so that we're not fronting it and then oh, absolutely. You know, we're just, we're, you know. And, and we want to do this financial analysis to ensure that the numbers that they're giving us make sense yeah. based on industry standards and that our investment is appropriate for each of the projects. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions for that? Yeah. Hey, hey, Mr. Chair, if I could, one yeah. other thing I would mention to you all. Um, I know you've seen, you're seeing these projects for the first time. You've um, obviously seen some of the affordable housing projects that have come through under Penny 4. Um, just something I wanted to mention to keep in mind. Um, the interlocal agreement that we have with all the municipalities that establishes the distribution formula also also called for a joint committee um, that got together in advance of any of these projects being reviewed and they established guidelines under which the affordable housing projects and the economic development projects would um, be reviewed over the 10-year period for Penny 4. So just keep that in mind um, as you look at these, again, the economic development and the affordable housing projects. You all did, um, at a past meeting, approve those guidelines that, that were developed by your staff, staff from various municipalities. So just, you know, again, something to, that I wanted to mention and keep in mind as you take a look at these projects. Okay. Okay. And you'll and you'll and this first go around, we'll get a pretty good description of what we're allowed to do, and then what these particular projects are asking for, why it makes yep. why it why it passes the muster, so to speak, but also why we should consider it as far as keeping more expansion here in the area, jobs, etc. Mm -hmm. But we want to make sure it covers both both of those. And you're going to do a yeah. presentation, right? At the yes, your meeting. Okay. So we'll go through that, and you can see it's only three projects, but you know you're talking about new manufacturing up in an area where you don't have the ceiling heights, et cetera, and stuff um, up in Oldsmar. You know, very important to modernize um, the our um, industrial warehouse or our industrial type space. Um, you've got the project in Pinellas Park that I just touched on. Then the other one's a skiff. Um, it's a sensitive uh, information where they can go in and and dial in and get uh, what they'd have to go on site to a military base to do. Um, we have a lot of industries uh, that need that access, but they don't have anywhere to go to do it. And, the, and over on the military base, it's really hard to schedule time to be able to go into their sensitive thing um, chambers to be able to um, uh, do that. So it's a, it's, a, it's a value add, it's a business enhancement uh, for companies that, uh, that need that type of access. So three projects that really are incentive based to help others grow and um, so okay all right thank you item 26 is a uh, resolution adopting the Port Pinellas safe, uh, safe streets um, Pinellas action plan and a vision zero approach to um, other projects so they'll be here to present on that um, 27 is brownfield rehabilitation uh, site rehabilitation this is for the Bay Point Golf um, Course Brownfield site that we um, purchased a couple years ago. Um, so we're, we're asking, we're, we're going to be seeking out um, money for that. 
Item number 28 is issuance of a uh, certificate of public commands and necessity uh, for helicopter ambulance service. Under item number 29, uh, we're asking the board's authority to file suit in this case. This is a code enforcement action. Um, items 30 and 31 are confidential items that I will uh, call to eat, speak with each one of you individually about prior to the meeting on Tuesday. Um, 31 also applies to this, but items 31, 32, and 33 all relate to the opioid litigation to which the county is a party. Uh, you all recall we had a shade meeting to discuss um, the litigation aspects of these items um, previously. So again, on item number 31, since that is active litigation, we brought that forward to you under a confidential memo. And if I have not already spoken with you about that, I will, I will do so prior to Tuesday. Items 32 and 33 what they are really doing is granting to the county administrator the authority to sign each of these two agreements. The reason why these are being brought forward in that manner is we don't have the final language on these agreements just yet. So we can't ask you all to approve them, but we are asking that you will delegate that authority to the county administrator, obviously working in conjunction um, with my office on final language there. So 32 is the agreement well, will be the agreement with the Attorney General to move forward in settlement of this case. Um, this sets up a, a framework for how funds coming through the state of Florida will be distributed. We're doing everything we can to maximize um, the funds that will be coming into Pinellas County. This model where settlement is taking place with the Attorney General of the state is the national model that we're really seeing in the opioid litigation, um, certainly favored by the defendants for a number of reasons, fewer people for them to negotiate with, and greater certainty um, in the long run as to what their total liability will be under these lawsuits. So. Again, 32 is the agreement with the Attorney General that will position Pinellas County uh, to maximize the funds that will ultimately come down here to Pinellas County. Um, 33 is an agreement with, <clears throat> will be an agreement with um, our litigating municipalities Hill here, which are St. Pete, Pinellas Park, and Clearwater. Um, Sorry, yes, Clearwater. This is something that we're putting into place, again, to position ourselves under that agreement with the Attorney General to maximize the funds that are going to flow through Pinellas County. Um, we, are, we will be agreeing to um, a number of items to get us, um, get us designated as a qualified county under the Attorney General's agreement. Um, some of those things are we're going to have an opioid abatement task force will be all of the funds and let me preface this I know you all have heard this all of the funds that flow out of this litigation will be directly used in support of opioid abatement. Um, so there will be restrictions on the use of these funds, unlike what you all saw uh, with, with the BP litigation. Um, so this uh, agreement again under. 33 um, is with the litigating municipalities here within uh, Pinellas County. By entering into the agreement with these three uh, municipalities, we will be that that we will meet one of the criteria to become a qualified county under the Attorney General's plan. Um, again, this is something that we did talk about at least a little bit um, in the shade meeting. I know that I have some meetings set up with some of you prior to Tuesday to go over this in a little bit more detail. Um, but certainly, if there's any questions on these things, um, we can try to answer it now or certainly answer it on Tuesday or between now and Tuesday. And then under 34, that's kind of our standing placeholder on uh, redistricting. I know that um, the consultant has been reaching out to you all to set up meetings. Um, so hopefully those are underway and we do still intend to bring forward those appointments um, at your first meeting in August. Okay, any questions at this point? Okay, go ahead, Barry. Under 35, um, we will have Lisa Foster and Kelly here um, back talking about FEMA maps. Um, we've been working, she has been working, Lisa, with the uh, municipalities. We'd love a, a countywide approach 
um, to how we're managing, you know, development going forward. Um, so we and she'll be presenting to the city managers on Friday or tomorrow. So um, as for a second time. Um, so she's collecting that, and then we have a little thing called the 2022 budget to to uh, present on next Tuesday. Um, will we have any of it populated here before then, or it's not there yet? So it's just the, the, the well, you mean the budget? Yeah. Um, yes. Uh, um, okay. So I'm, That's fine. I'm I'm meeting with Cecilia uh, this afternoon. <laughs> We've had a few. We were supposed to meet yesterday, and uh, things got a little you know busy over the weekend. So. Um, yes, you'll have the presentation. Um, it will have, we'll have both the presentation and they'll upload the budget. Um, remember, this is just for the public's purpose. This is just kicking it off. And so over the next two months, um, you have many meetings uh, scheduled, public hearings, uh, before you finally um, you know, adopt what you de finally determine. So, um, but yeah, we'll be uploading that. Okay. Thank you. Um, Item 36 is re appointments, reappointments uh, to the Parks and Conservation Advisory Board. 37 is uh, your general commissioner updates. Moving on to public hearings. Uh, 38 is uh, an ordinance amending countywide rules. This is uh, Ford Pinellas has um, presented to amend the, the residential equivalency standards for assisted living facilities. Item 39 is um, a re and this is uh, for um, utilities. No? Yes. Jill, do you, is this utilities presenting this or is this uh, Kelly? Utility? I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, so this is a, a, a code that is no longer applicable and it's causing issues, so they're asking to repeal this, and they'll explain it. Okay. Item 40 is a request to vacate a um, right away. Um, it, it, our recommendation is denial of the petition to vacate um, due to we have um, trans potential for transportation uh, improvement needs, utilities have infrastructure in the area, and it's also identified in our, our long-term um, stormwater uh, drainage plans. Item 41 is a request for a land use change from residential suburban and preservation to residential low and preservation. Um, this is one you heard before up, up north, and um, the the applicants agreed to certain restrictions. Um, I know there's still concerns amongst the residents in the area, um, but staff did meet with them and talk to them about modifications to their application. Um, you can, it's spelled out here um, what they would agree to, but um, there, there's, there's still concerns I know amongst the community. So this is your second of the two required public hearings. Item 42 is, um, okay, item 42 and 43 go together. It's, uh, this is an ordinance amending uh, zoning chapter for historic preservation uh, for the land development code and establishing downtown Palm Harbor um, form based code. Uh, there's been a long time in the making. They've been working hard on working with the community in terms of uh, improvements and how to develop uh, in that downtown Palm Harbor area. Um, so this is the, the one piece, and then the second piece is a zoning change um, and to, uh, to establish uh, that di zoning district in downtown Palm Harbor. Item 44 is approval of the um, CDBG and Home and Emergency Solutions Grant Annual Action Plan. That's all I got. Okay. We, it'll be a busy, busy meeting. Um, <laughs> yeah, seriously. Just to say the least, especially with the budget piece, I think trying to get our hands around, the, arms around that, I guess, or more than arms around all of it. Um, yeah, I'm, re I'm really proud of our departments. You'll see a, I, I, what I believe is a good budget considering, you know, all we've been through this past year. Um, and so we're going to outline that. I'm sure there's going to be lots of discussions over the next two months. Commissioner Gerard. Yeah, I just wanted to ask if we could either have a brief discussion at this meeting or schedule something about um, related to the 
building collapse in Dade County. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't think we have anything on the books that requires inspections after a certain length of time. And I was thinking about all those towers out on the beach that were constructed back in the 60s and 70s. Um, so um, we makes me I, nervous. I'd rather have Blake um, in for this discussion. So we'll certainly schedule that um, if you don't mind. Um, yeah, I'm actually sure. meeting with him and Tom, I think this afternoon. Um, and so I, I asked him to look at that. I'm sure. going to be meeting with him and, and, and talking about it. I will tell you this, that it's each, it's each individual municipality has that authority. And, and so we could be, you know, in a case where people want to do different things. We could look at it from a countywide authority. And the, but there's a lot of key issues that go into this. Is it delegated and they have to do it? What if we get that information? How, what do we do with it? Are we going to mandate? improvements what if they don't do those and it's it got really complicated in the 10 minute conversation i had with blake um, but it is something that i know is going to be a concern of yours so we're we're looking at it from a staff standpoint and we'll we'll schedule a time to discuss that with you okay mr Chief. and i would like to see it be a countywide issue i mean i know it could be very expensive but there were an awful lot of things that got thrown up really fast back in the 70s up and down the beach, and that's, you know. Commissioner should be Justice, here. and then I'll get you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. On um, kind of same in the same area, we've been getting a lot of uh, uh, emails and calls about the um, emergency radio Correct. on on towers and things mm -hmm. like that. And I know mainly we're hearing it in the city of Clearwater, but if, if maybe um, if we could have a part of a discussion or if Mr. Pogarty could do a, a memo to us to, uh, you know, any update from where we are on the county side of things. We, we can do that also. I've asked Lourdes to prepare uh, something for you. Um, I will tell you that the, the law is crystal clear that it, it, that it is a um, building owner's responsibility, um, not a county to put that in. Um, but we will we'll outline that for you because I know you're getting that question. Thank you. Commissioner, Ju uh, Commissioner Justice, uh, Commissioner Long. I would like to get back to Commissioner Gerard's comments because I know I have lived here since 1972 and several of those large uh, condominium complexes come to my mind that were up then, which is way, way, way before the newest um, industry standards for construction came into play after Hurricane Irma, really. And so I do have concerns about the quality and the safety of some of these structures. And I do think that looking at it in a comprehensive countywide way is the very least that we should be doing because as we all have heard and read, the issue with the Surfside Tower has existed for 20 years and they knew about it, but they didn't take any action. And so this is a lot longer than that that we're talking about. And I think what we don't know is as bad as what we do know. Okay. We'll, we'll schedule that. Thank you. For our time. Uh, yeah, interesting that I was, I was just going to mention, I had mentioned in a letter that I sent to one of our residents yesterday about um, uh, sending a note out to everybody. We're kind of six months through this calendar year, and I was thinking about a multiple of issues that folks might be thinking about to come to a workshop for discussion. Um, so just be thinking about that. I'm going to send out an, um, a, 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 a letter or memo to you guys just kind of outlining some things, but maybe just think about some things that we want to bring to a workshop. I mean, I, I know we got a lot of things scheduled in workshops, but there may be a good mm -hmm. three-hour workshop where we can hit on maybe 10 items and mm -hmm. just give some thoughts to it and just put it aside or give some thoughts and some direction. Mm -hmm. Things that may be weighing on your minds or that we just haven't dealt with because there's been so many items to deal with. Um, mm -hmm. some, some we will all like and some we won't all like, but I think it's good to be having that discussion. God bless you. So, um, and we'll, we'll try to target, Barry and I were working on a date for that, but just be thinking along those lines um, sometime in the, not, not this month and not next month, but after that, September, October-ish. Commissioner Jar, did you have a question?
question. I just had an issue I wanted to put on your list, and that was the, uh, I know we're going to be talking a lot more about sewer laterals, but the thing about requiring laterals to be looked at when, when, a, when a structure is being completely rebuilt or even 50% rebuilt, yeah. I think it's something we have to take to the legislature and, you know, if we wait till September, we're waiting another year for, a, for them to preempt us from doing that. <laughs> So, all right. Just a thought. Okay. Anything else for, for Barry or for Jewel or for any of you all? Okay. Thank you all for being here, and we'll see you on Tuesday.